Well, good morning, everyone. You know, it's like I always say, you know you're in for a doozy of a sermon when a guy named Rocky, who's been hitting things with sticks, comes up to the podium. Well, we're in part two of our holiness series. And I trust that last week you were blessed with what Pastor Dale shared with us to have a better understanding of the reality of who God is. The holiness is more than just a denominational preference. It is who God is. And it is who we become when we belong to him. So today we are going to talk about the holy home. While there might be a lot of doctrine that we hear when it comes to the framing of holiness, my hope and prayer today is that each of us here is going to find ourselves being addressed with what God's word has to say about who you are and how you belong to your family. Would you join me in prayer? Gracious Heavenly Father, we thank you so much for your holy word. We thank you, Lord, that in your divine, perfect love for us, you don't leave us to ourselves to figure out our own relationships. Lord, you give us your truth. You give us your whole self. My prayer today, Lord, is that each of us would understand how you are speaking to us. We would take into deep consideration, first and foremost, our relationship with you, and how that transforms all of our relationships. So I ask and I pray this in the mighty name of Jesus. And everyone here said, Amen. Amen. The holy home. So we are going to spend some time this morning in two passages. We're going to hang out in Deuteronomy. And then we're going to spend a little bit of time in Ephesians. But the big point that I hope we all keep in mind as we look at this today, your relationship with God will transform all of your relationships, but especially your family. Now let's talk a little bit about the book of Deuteronomy. I found this very interesting image. It's a lithograph. So I spent hours upon hours of trying to get a little bit of understanding on Deuteronomy, just scouring the internet, and all I could come up with, it was written a long time ago by a guy named Moses. That's a joke. The theme of Deuteronomy is a deep, personal relationship with God. Let's understand that a little bit more. Moses spoke with God face to face. God commands Moses to address the nation of Israel. The nation of Israel is comprised of tribes, communities. Tribes and communities are comprised of families. Families consist of husbands and wives and children. And for your consideration, what the Word of God says, husbands and wives reflect the image of God. Deuteronomy is a magnificent address that speaks to the nation, but speaks to the individual, as God commands Moses to speak. 
And my challenge today, as I read through this and prayed about this, is while this book is thousands of years old, it is the foundation of how God reveals himself to us, God is speaking to us today with what he shares through this passage in the book of Deuteronomy. Deuteronomy is filled with specific and repeated commands, keeping in context of how this occurred and how it was ultimately written down, it was mostly heard by people. Most people then weren't reading, and when it was written down, it would be read publicly. So as you read through the book of Deuteronomy, it will appear to be repetitive, but remember, most of the people then were listening to someone speak. So there's a reason why things are repeated over and over again. And when it comes to family relationships, that is repeated significantly among many other specific commands in the book of Deuteronomy. And one other comment that I'll make before we take a look at these passages is God God is very concerned with you not just hearing, but responding to what you've been heard. And among the other things to consider is that when you have maybe, I don't know, a, just a scholarly or perhaps a secular opinion of Deuteronomy, while you read it, it appears to be just written commands or tasks, again, there's a very, very important distinction. This is not about just rules and laying the foundation of a religion. This is all God speaking to deal with you and me relationally. It's not religion, it's relationship. So let's take a closer look at particularly family relationships. Let's start first, among many of the repeated themes, commands, passages of what God is sharing. Let's look at uh, Deuteronomy chapter 4, verse 9. If you've got a Bible, or certainly you can follow along on screen here. just want to read verses uh, 9 and 10. Only give heed to yourself and keep your soul diligently, so that you do not forget the things which your eyes have seen and they do not depart from your heart all the days of your life, but make them known to your sons and to your grandsons. Verse 10. Remember the day you stood before the Lord your God at Horeb, When the Lord said to me, assemble the people to me that I may let them hear my words so they may learn to fear me all the days they live on the earth and that they may teach their children. Remember the Lord and teach your children. Interesting. Out of all the things that God would specifically bring to our attention, first you remember him, and then you talk about him to your children. When you start digging into the Hebrew words, it's here in verse 9 and 10, and we're going to look at it here in Verse uh, chapter 6, the Hebrew word is shama. And that just simply means to hear. Now, when you dig deeper into what the Hebrew is actually sharing, hearing is not just I've received information, hearing is I've received information. And I'm taking action. 
I'm hearing and I'm responding. It's kind of like what grandma always used to say. It can go in one ear and out the other. But that's really what we're trying to get at here. If you didn't do what you heard, the implication is you didn't hear it. Rocky, go clean up your room. Okay. Two, two hours later. Rocky, you didn't clean up your room. Did you hear me? Uh, Shama. Let's look at chapter 6. We're going to just focus in on verse 1 and 2, and then we're going to look at a passage of Scripture that might be very familiar. Chapter 6, verse 1. Now, this is the commandment, the statutes and the judgments, which your Lord, your God, has commanded me to teach you, that you might do them in the land which you are going over to possess it, so that you and your son and your grandson might fear the Lord your God to keep all his statutes, his commandments, which I command you, all the days of your life, and that your days may be prolonged. That's a nice promise. Here we go. The great Shema. Hear, O Israel, the Lord is our God. The Lord is one. You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your might. These words which I am commanding you today shall be on your heart. You shall teach them to your sons and shall talk of them when you sit in your house and when you walk by the way and when you lie down and when you rise up. You shall bind them as a sign on your hand and they shall be as frontals on your forehead. You shall write them on the doorposts of your house and on your gates. All right, there's a lot to unpack here. Let's go back here. Deuteronomy 6.1. Moses is making it very clear. This isn't just his thoughts. This aren't his anecdotal opinions. Moses is saying, this is what God has for me to tell you. So that's important. We're going to listen to what it is that God's laid out for us. And again, statutes, commands, judgments, rules, regulations. Let me throw this out there for your consideration. There's a reason why we have speed limits. There's a reason why we have yellow lines and white lines. It's so we don't kill ourselves. What is our human nature without yellow lines and white lines and speed limits? It's self-destruction. Rules, God is saying, I want you to stop for a moment and to listen that I have your best interest at hand because I love you perfectly. It's not about religion. This isn't Judaism that then is piggybacked by Christianity. This is God speaking to you and me, and he says today, I love you. Look at verse 2. God says, I love you, and you're going to teach that to your kids and your grandkids so that they will know that I love them. 
And by the way, God actually is really, really good. All your days may be prolonged. I know some people might find that conditional, but I'm going to really trust in God and what he says about his promise to us when we follow and obey him. The great Shema. The Lord is our God. The Lord is one. You can really, really spend some time digging and digging and digging. Yes, it's reference to the Trinity, but it's also God being first in your life. The Lord is our God. The Lord is one. Is God first in your life? No matter what circumstance you are in, if you start here, everything else will fall into place. And when God is first in your life, let's look at how we respond. When God is first in your life, you're going to not just casually have a circumstantial emotional love for God. This is a poetic way of saying you're going to love God with everything, everything, everything. Your emotions, your thoughts, your actions, and the part of yourself that is a part of you that you don't realize exists fully because it's an eternal part of you that God has created and is a part of you. You know, when I do this kind of teaching with kids, when we talk about the soul, I say, point to your heart. Okay, yeah, here it is. Yeah, your heart is beating. Point to your mind. Yeah, there it is. Your heart, your mind is thinking. Point to your soul. Uh Well, you have it. Because God made it. You love God with everything about yourself. The temporal and eternal. You don't leave anything away. So God is first in your life. And you love him because he loves you. Not just emotional love. We're talking a deep, perfect love. And then you consider these. You consider these truths in your heart. Now watch what happens, because this progression is very, very important. So you respond to God. You love the Lord because he loves you. And then you teach them to your sons. You teach them to your kids. When do you do it? All the time. When you sit in your house, when you walk by the way, when you're getting ready for bed, when you walk up in the morning. You say, well, Rocky, that seems kind of laborious, maybe religious. Maybe. But when you approach this all relationally, and the perfect relational God that we have, that's how you're going to model to your children and to your family. And I, and I would like to encourage you Maybe this seems a bit routine, but I would, I would encourage you to think, especially if you have your own children, something as simple as, wow, look at the sunrise this morning. Isn't God's creation beautiful? Wow, look at the birds. Isn't what God has made just simply marvelous? You know, the Bible says that God knows every single bird and every movement of every bird, and he cares for them, and he cares for you even more than he cares for those birds. We have teachable moments, and they're there if you look for them. You shall bind them as a sign on your hand, and shall be as frontals on your forehead. You're carrying God's word with you. If you want to get a face tattoo, just do a Bible verse. That's okay. I don't recommend that, but 
You shall write them on your doorposts and on your own gates. Let's have the word of God in our homes. No, God's a gentleman. He's not going to force himself in unless you give him permission. So good Christians, let's keep Hobby Lobby in business here, okay? So you're going to head out and you're going to get some good verse artwork. And I'm not just talking faith, hope, love. Like get some real passages of scripture, okay? Put them in your house. Let everyone know we take the word of God seriously here. Amen, right? Okay, all kidding aside. Teaching your children about your relationship with God is repeated many times in the book of Deuteronomy. You'll find it, it's laid in foundationally in Exodus, it's repeated again in Leviticus, but Moses is really, really commanded by God. I'm reminding you people, remember what I have done for you, remember my love for you, don't let your children forget it. Don't let your children forget it. You fast forward a couple of books chronologically, we get to Judges, and there arose another generation in Israel who did not know the Lord, and that was a really dark and wicked time in that nation's history. How do we change a country? We start in the home. How do you start in your home? You start with God being first. You follow him, and then you show that to your family. That's how nations change. That's how God changes. Okay, I got a little preachy there for a second, sorry. Deuteronomy chapter 31. Interesting, interesting passage. More anecdotal, but... I, I really want to share it with you guys today. So Moses here, we're coming to the end of the great speech, the national address in Deuteronomy. And this is in the context of the Feast of Booths, which was a very specific holiday where the nation of Israel were to construct shelters that were reminding them of how God took care of them as they wandered in the wilderness. Don't forget, God took care care of you. And then, by doing this, they would open up the scrolls, the word of God that they had at this point in time, which would be this law, the book of the law, the first five books of the Bible, and they would read it out loud. Public reading of scripture. So now, here we go. Verse 12 and 13. Assemble the people, the men and the women and the children and the alien who is in your town. That's interesting. So that they may hear and learn and fear the Lord your God and be careful to observe all the words of this law. Their children who have not known will hear and learn to fear the Lord your God. God. God loves children. We think of evangelism as only being just this New Testament thing. God loves all children. He loves them then, he loves them now. And isn't it interesting how he gives this responsibility for those who know him to make it clear that they are responsible for the children around them to know him. Not just their family, but the children who aren't Israelites. How precious is that? How seriously should we consider that today? God loves children. So I'm going to just restate the very first slide I had up. Your relationship with God will transform all of your relationships, but especially your family. So now 
Let me just say it again, but differently. Because God is holy, Christ-following families should treat one another differently. You're not going to treat each other circumstantially on every single whim and, Im- whim and impulse. We're going to treat each other differently. So easy to say and so hard to do. Trust me. <laughs> There's a lot of passages in the New Testament that Paul, when he writes his letters, and when Peter, he writes his letters, they talk about how families love each other. Today, I just want to hone in specifically on these passages in Ephesians, but they're in virtually every single letter. As we consider our holiness weeks, the lessons, the sermons. This just sums it up. When it comes to loving the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your might, with all your, with all your soul, let's say it another way. Therefore, be imitators of God as beloved children. In my study Bible here, there are parallel passages that are referenced with this, interestingly, two gospel passages. In Luke chapter 6, verse 36, Jesus says, be merciful just as your Father in heaven is merciful. And then in Matthew 5, 48, Jesus says, be perfect just as your Father in heaven is perfect which is rephrasing of what was said in Leviticus. Be holy, for I am holy. And let me give you just a little rocky anecdote. Anecdote. You don't make yourself holy. Jesus Christ, through the Holy Spirit, is your identity when you put your full trust in in him, and you desire to become more like him and less like what you are like without him. That's a good place to start when we talk about holiness. And how do you imitate God when he's just three letters on a page? Do you know him? Among one of the most transformational personal experiences I have had following Christ was him reminding me that there's a difference between knowing of him and knowing him. Him, because he knows you. And he wants you to know him. This is relational, folks. You will imitate God when you know him with how you talk, with how you act, and really where the rubber meets the road, folks, is how you think. That's where most of it starts. Let's jump ahead to Ephesians chapter 6. Let's talk about family. We love our families. They're a blessing. They're a joy. They're complicated and they're messy. They're sinners and they're redeemed sinners. And we're all going to relate to this in one way or another. So let's look at uh, chapter 6, verses 1 through 4. And then we're going to backtrack a moment. Let's talk about parents and kids. 
Children, obey your parents in the Lord, for this is right. Honor your father and mother, which is the first commandment, with a promise, so that it may be well with you and that you may live long on the earth. Fathers, do not provoke your children to anger, but bring them up in the discipline and instruction of the Lord. Verse 1 and 2, children obey your parents. Children, youth, adult children, if your parents obey the Lord, then this is the structure that he's put in place in order to obey God and how they display and share a testimony of God with you. Kids, obey your parents. And it's an easy progression if your parents are doing their parenting with the best intention. Your parents aren't always going to get it right. Me being a parent, I don't. But I trust in the Lord. When you're young and you live in your parents' home, you obey them as long as it doesn't violate the word of God. Now I want to take a moment to point out the distinction between obeying your parents and honoring your parents. Because here we got this in all caps. This is the Ten Commandments. This is what we just glanced at in Deuteronomy too. Kids, you obey your parents. And then here in our culture, in our time, you're 18, you're out. Most, not all. Some people like to hang around a bit longer. You obey your parents under their roof. You honor your parents outside the home. What is said about you and how you conduct yourself at school, at work, at a party, is how you will honor your parents. You can honor them or you can shame them. And oh, by the way, if you honor your parents, you honor the Lord. There comes a time when you're old enough, you're going to recognize the distinction between obeying your parents when it's right and then your parents' dysfunction. And there's a difference. When you're an adult, you don't obey parents' dysfunction. You honor your parents. And you will honor the Lord by doing so. Obey your parents and then honor them. And that's got a promise to it too. Don't overlook that. There's a lot of practical wisdom in that. You know, don't go out drinking and driving in the middle of the night on icy roads. Duh. You'll end up dead. How's that for father wisdom? Okay, verse four. Fathers, do not provoke your children to anger, but bring them up in the discipline and instruction of the Lord. There's a lot that can be said about this verse. I just want to share with you how Jesus has been speaking and ministering to me. Occasionally, you'll read a passage of scripture, you've read it a hundred times, and then you read it and it's like you've read it for the first time. Matthew chapter 11, Jesus is talking and he's addressing people who are extremely burdened by what was taken in the Old Testament and then this was added on and then this was added on and then this was added on. They're like, I, I am really failing at this religion. And they are absent of a relationship with the Lord God who loves them. And Jesus reminds them, come to me, you who are weary and heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke, or you could say, take my teaching upon yourself because I am gentle and humble in heart. 
how Jesus deals with us, dads, is how we should deal with our children with gentleness and humility because you were a sticky booger just like them. And how much when I consider how Jesus has dealt with me when I have deserved thwack, kick, smite, smash. But that's not how he has dealt with me. He's dealt with me with gentleness and humility. And by the way, it's not deserved. And in that moment, mom or dad, dad especially, you may not think your kid deserves gentleness, but they deserve grace. They deserve unmerited favor because that's how you've been dealt with by the Lord Jesus. So, Dad, you may realize your responsibility, but you don't lord that over your kids to provoke them to anger. This isn't a chess game. This is about displaying to them the truth and the testimony of Jesus Christ. Now, you're responsible for setting good boundaries in place. You bring them up in the discipline and the instruction of the Lord, and you teach them by how you display it. I'm preaching to myself here. And it's interesting, too, because I know we have a lot of cultural and uh, millennia, context, difference between what is said here in Ephesians and where we are today. But dads, let me say it this way. When you get home from doing your work or whatever your responsibility is, you don't check out. In fact, that's the time to check in. I know the easy thing to do is to say, hey, I'm beat, I'm burnt out, I'm spent. You grew this thing in your belly, you deal with it. There's a responsibility, Dad. There's a responsibility. And your responsibility is to discipline them and love them and instruct them the way Jesus loves and disciplines and instructs us as a grown adult children. Okay. So let's talk about husbands and wives. Oh boy, here we go. I want to read the passage of scripture about marriage from Ephesians, and that's preceding what we just read in chapter 6. This is chapter 5. I made a very deliberate decision to leave this verse on screen as we read the instruction on marriage to keep this in context as you hear what is written if you are following along in your bible here we are in ephesians 5 verse 22 and we'll go to verse 31 wives be subject to your own husbands as to the lord for the husband is the head of the wife as Christ is also the head of the church. Wow, what a weighty responsibility. He himself being the savior of one body, but as the church is subject to Christ, so also the wives ought to be to their husbands in everything. Husbands, love your wives just as Christ also loved the church and gave himself up so that he might sanctify her having cleansed her by the washing of water with the word, that he might present to himself the church in all her glory, having no spot or wrinkle or any such thing, but that she would be holy and blameless. So husbands ought to also love their own wives as their own bodies. He who loves his own wife loves himself, for no one has ever hated his own flesh, but nourishes and cherishes it, just as Christ also does the church, because we are members of his body. 
For this reason, a man shall leave his father and mother and shall be joined to his wife, and the two shall become one flesh. Paul goes on to say, this mystery is great, but I'm speaking with reference to Christ and the church. Nevertheless, each individual among you is also to love his own wife, even as himself, and the wife must see to it that she respects her husband. Today, for us as modern readers, we really need to read this passage of Scripture very carefully because, boy, there's a lot of explaining to do. (laughs) But let's talk about this oneness because we really get hung up on wives be subject to your husbands. That's a big hang up. Amen, right? But listen, I'll tell you what, I haven't been married as long as most of you here, but I've been married long enough to kind of figure out a few things. So let me give you some rocky comments here. Let's start by, what does God do us a favor by pointing out patterns of dysfunction? starts right here. First, God wanted husbands and wives to be his image. One. Talk about a lofty purpose. How did Satan approach Eve? Did he approach Adam and Eve? Or were they separate were they together were they one when God calls out to Adam where are you here I am I'm naked and I'm hiding because I know I'm naked and God says who told you this And watch what Adam does. He says, this woman you gave me, gave me the fruit, and it's her fault. The oneness was separated. And then God says to Eve... Childbearing is going to be difficult and your impulse is going to be that you want to control this guy who just kicked you to the curb. Oh, and by the way, man whose deferred responsibility work's going to really, really be bittersweet. There's where the dysfunction started. Wives, women, you're not going to fix the guy. God's going to fix the guy. Guys, it's time to put on your big boy belt and to take on the responsibility that was discarded right at the beginning. That responsibility is shared together. And our impulses are going to do everything they can to try to divide us as husbands and wives. That's how Satan gets in your house and starts messing things up. When your relationship starts to become tense or estranged or bitter or angry, See, when you are together and reflect the image of God, that is a beautiful thing. That is a powerful thing. That is the partnership that he models in his very nature. God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit. And oh, by the way, he grants us that partnership as humanity made in his image. That husbands and wives would flourish and replicate his image all over the earth for all time, building and developing beautiful civilization for his glory. And that's what our future and our hope is going to be like. 
We don't continue reproducing, but we assume that role of partnership with him because of his salvation for us. So there's a lot that can be said about this passage of scripture, but I want to encourage us today to consider the oneness, the oneness in our marriage, the oneness of being image bearers of God That's enough of what, me talking about it. Let's, let's see what Jesus has to say about this. John chapter 17, verses 20 through 23. He's praying before he goes to the cross. I do not ask on behalf of these alone, but for those who also believe in me through their word. He's talking about people who would come to know him through the ministry of his disciples that he just prayed for by the power of and the will of the Holy Spirit. Look at this. That they may all be one. Even as you, Father, are in me, and I in you, that they also may be in us. So that the world may believe that you sent me. The glory which you have given me, I have given to them that they may be one just as we are one, I and them, and you and me, that they may be perfected in unity so that the world may know that you sent me and love them even as you have loved me. And does that include husband and wives? You better believe it does. Let's finish with this. What is your relationship like with your family? What is your relationship like with your spouse? What is your relationship like with our holy God? You start here, everything else will be exactly where God wants it to be. So as we conclude part two of our holiness sermons, think about where you are today with the Lord your God. And may that continue to transform your relationships with your spouse and with your children and with everyone that God has in your life. Today, if you would like to make a decision or re-decide a few things, you are welcome to come forward. You are welcome to be prayed with. Pastor Tom, myself, we're happy to pray with you. But beyond coming forward, consider what God has spoken and what God has said today. Pastor Mike will conclude with some worship.
please join me in prayer. Lord Jesus, we thank you so much for your perfect love for us. We thank you, Lord, that you call upon us and we belong to you. We pray that we would just continue to grow in our grace and in our knowledge of you, that we would be imitators of you, that, Lord, we are known by our relationship with you, and that would continue to transform in your holiness our relationships with the people that you have blessed us with, the most precious, our spouses, our children. Lord, I pray that your Holy Spirit would just continue to minister to each of us, draw us close to you for your glory and for your name's sake. In the mighty name of Jesus, I pray. And everyone here said, amen. amen. Thank you. Please stay warm.